there's still people coming in the door. All right. Is there anybody? Can anyone raise your hand if there's a seat next to you so we can just pack more people in here? More? More? There are no seats. All right. There's no seat left, seats left. Sorry. Um, there's like a windowsill over there. I don't know. All right, it's about time to get started. Thank you for coming to High Performance Theming at DrupalCon Munich 2012. My name is Chris Ruppel, more on that later. Is everything good? Yeah. So who am I? I'm Chris Ruppel. I'm a front end developer at Four Kitchens. Uh, I do Drupal stuff occasionally. I've got a couple modules. I like doing the core development sometimes uh, when it's not too difficult. I let Mark do the rest of that. Uh, COD, and then uh, it needs a little bit of love, but Drush Make Me is a generator for uh, Drush Make. Uh, so, what is this about? High performance theming. It's actually not about theming. Uh, because no one would come if you didn't put the word theming in a front-end development talk at a DrupalCon. So it's actually about front-end performance. And the basic idea is that we have a lot of flashy effects, and they're all really cool, and we've got all these new browser capabilities, but it's more important to make stuff that's lean and fast. And you can have both, and that's what we're going to talk about here. Because users actually want performance over effects, even if they don't realize it. Uh, because a site could be cool, but if it's not loading quickly, then they're just going to walk away anyway. And mobile devices make this stuff way more difficult. Uh, latency, bandwidth, uh, connection speeds, and all sorts of stuff like that. It just exacerbates the problems. So here's a short rundown of what we're going to talk about today in order to help make awesome websites that also run really well. Front-end development, how can I build and debug faster? Uh, web performance, we're going to talk about how to make pages load quickly uh, when they're actually deployed and live. And then some Drupal-specific tools, because it wouldn't be a DrupalCon session without a couple of those. So first, front-end development. The, your best tool here is actually the browser. Uh, there used to be extensions and things uh, that you would download and add on to your browser to make them uh, a developer tool, but that is no longer the case. Uh, all the browsers, they come with these tools included because they want developers to use the browser first. Um, Mosaic was the first browser, and it was actually an editor in addition to a consuming device, and we kind of got away for that, from that for a while, uh, but now we're back uh, into that uh, development workflow. Um, there are lots of local development tools that help you build sites, and uh, I know that uh, uh, Chrome in particular is about to uh, release a couple features that let you make changes in the browser and then save them straight to disk. So they really want you to use the browser as your authoring tool, not just a consuming tool. Because all these browsers want the open web to win. Uh, so all, the, all of them share features and they all have the same kind of development tools embedded in them, Opera, IE even, uh, Firefox and Chrome. Uh, Safari, um, they, they all want this. Um, and then I just want to make a note that any of you are welcome to go and make suggestions to these browser makers when you're doing your development because they want to hear from you. And they want to know what you need so that they can make the browser a better tool for you. And there's a couple Twitter accounts, go bug them. So I'm going to talk about a couple Chrome DevTools tips here. Uh, and like I said, uh, the feature set is similar in all these browsers. Um, Firebug has to be downloaded for Firefox, but Firefox proper does have some development tools that are very similar. Um, so you can get these features in all of the web browsers. I picked one because Chrome is what I use on a day-to-day -day basis. Whoops. Uh, so this is a cool one. If you do responsive 
web design, uh, now the dev tools can kind of show you what media query is actually uh, 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 the media query that uh, finally affected the element that you're looking at. So if you've got a couple different uh, width settings in a different media query, you can see that at a glance now. Um, now this is an oldie but goodie in like Firefox. Uh, there's a user agent switcher uh, add-on that's been around for ages. Um, but now this got dropped into Chrome proper uh, and Opera's had it forever uh, just because of their uh, relatively low market share. Um, but you can override, override the user agent and um, Chrome, you can now even override the device metrics and tell it, hey, I'm actually 320 by 480. It's got a little uh, switch button there so that you can um, simulate device orientation change. And they've got font scale factor and, and you can even emulate touch events uh, for when you want to do uh, feature detection testing in a browser, which you should always use a real device, but it can be helpful. And then also we've got uh, disabling cache. So browsers will do all sorts of caching that we don't even think about anymore. You know, you've got your normal clear the cache uh, to clear out like images you've downloaded, but there's DNS caching, there's all sorts of caching that they do, and you can disable all of that. Uh, like in Chrome, you can do it when the dev tools are open, it'll just turn the cache off, period. And you don't have to worry about it, uh, which is really good when you're trying to test uh, network latency and like page speed downloads and stuff like that, which we're gonna get to in a minute. Um, so network waterfalls are another great thing. Uh, not used as often as we'd like, but that's why we're here, right? And this should be your first step to debug load time issues. So when you've got a page that's like part of the page loads and then it hangs and then, oh, there it goes. And you're just like, ah, I wonder why that was so slow. Maybe I shouldn't use so many fonts or whatever. But you can actually figure this out. Now, this projector can't handle the size of screenshot I took. That's my fault, sorry. Uh, but you get the idea here. The waterfall will show you the exact sequence of downloads that happened in your page. Um, and you can see up here at the top that uh, when you open the dev tools, there is a network tab that you can access. Uh, Elements is off to the side there. I'm sure we all use that one very often. And so this network tab will show you uh, the sequence of downloads as the browser assembled the page. And we've got a couple. My first screenshot is not going to show you this, but maybe I can drag it. Nope. Uh, in the very corner is going to show you the amount of time that it took to download the page. That's in the bottom left. The next uh, uh, number there is the amount of data that was transferred. So you can see the total page weight of, of, your, of, your down, uh, of the page. And also the amount of time that it took to download. And there are two numbers here. There is an onload, which we're all probably familiar with if you ever set up like Dreamweaver mouse overs a long time ago. And then there's uh, DOM content loaded, which is actually a more important number because that's the point uh, in the page load where we all start to feel like the page is loaded. It's when things start showing up, CSS starts rendering the page. Um, and this is due to the uh, ability of the browser to, to pre-parse information and start assembling the web page before it's actually finished downloading everything. Um, and so you've got this blue line on the waterfall also that'll help you figure out when your DOM content uh, event is actually happening. And the further left we push, uh, well, left for you, for you guys, uh, the further left uh, you push the blue line, uh, the better your page is going to be, the faster it's going to seem that it's loading. Even if it takes another second to load assets, if you're doing that asynchronously, um, people will still feel like the page is already finished. So if you want more information about browser tools, uh, because this would be, this could be a four hour session just on browser tools alone, go read these links. Um, I've got all these slides online. At the end, we'll, we'll have links, so uh, uh, read more about it. This is uh, from jQuery UK earlier this year. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So uh, the next topic here is web performance. How do we make these pages load fast? That's just what we were looking at, right? So I want to issue a warning here. Not everything in this section is universal and you shouldn't just take everything uh, that's listed here and then do it all because it's possible that you could even hurt your performance by blindly applying optimizations where none is needed. So you want to look 
at your site and you want to take these tools and you want to test them and you want to figure out what is actually wrong with your page and apply a fix for that particular issue. Get good data, analyze it. So having said that, let's talk about some universal fixes. <laughs> You can reduce your HTTP requests, uh, minify and concatenate CSS and JS, uh, combine images into sprites, and move scripts to the bottom. All these things are things that you should always do, uh, regardless of my previous advice. Um, network latency is one of the worst offenders of page performance. Uh, a lot of times you make a request and then you sit there for 400 milliseconds just waiting for the server to get back to you. Now, that may not be a problem for one request if you've got a big image sprite, but if you've requested 13 images for a page, you're going to multiply the amount of time that you're waiting if it's not using something like Speedy, which is the next version of HTTP. Um, so we're not going to talk about any of these. These are kind of basic, and there are definitely other DrupalCon presentations that have happened in the past and other just web development presentations where this information is available. Let's have some real fun. We're going to talk about a few JavaScript tools because we all love JavaScript, right? You do. Uh, there are a couple tools here that I'm uh, just blatantly explaining from South Street by Filament Group. Uh, they are a shop primarily based in Boston, Massachusetts, and I don't know if anyone heard about the Boston Globe redesign uh, sometime this year or last year, but it was a really, really big responsive launch. And so there were a lot of JavaScript tools that came out of this because as we mentioned, when you're doing uh, any kind of web development, but especially responsive when you've got a mobile site to serve and a richer desktop experience, you want everything to load fast and you want it to load intelligently. So they put a lot of work into making tools that are going to make our jobs easier. Hooray! So Essential is the first one. The problem is that CSS is often loaded when it's not needed. Um, we use media queries uh, to, to restrict the display of our CSS on a page, but oftentimes even if you split it up into files and put the media query directly in the attribute of the link tag, that does not stop the browser from downloading it. It still goes and gets it. Um, so what you want to do is use this tool because you want to avoid CSS from being loaded unless it's truly going to be used. A perfect example would be a style sheet that has min width 1400 pixels or something very large for a desktop. And then an iPhone is going to download this or a mobile phone in general. And then it's also going to go download those enormous images that are in that style sheet. It's never going to display them. It's just downloading it for fun. That's not good. So Essential will only load CSS that is used immediately. It is a tiny little piece of JavaScript you, instead of making link tags, you load up this array of code into the head of your document, and then it figures out how big the window is now. It figures out how big the window could ever get, and then it loads some of it directly, and it lazy loads the rest of it, um, and then it doesn't load some of it, which is awesome. This is free and open source. It is on GitHub. Picture fill. There's a lot of talk in the Drupal community about picture fill right now, but let's talk about the general problem first. So we need some images. Uh, a lot of times we put images in content. What do you know? And when you're loading an image onto a mobile phone, you need a smaller one than you need for a desktop uh, layout, for instance. And uh, affecting uh, this a loading a big image can affect the usability and the page speed. So if you're loading a big thousand pixel wide image and the device that you're looking at is only 320 by 480, then you're wasting a lot of bandwidth and you're wasting someone's time while they wait to download that image. So we need to avoid doing that when possible. This is doable in CSS with the other tool uh, that I just mentioned, but when we have content images, that's a little different. Luckily, we do have the wonderful image styles in Drupal 7, image cache in Drupal 6. Uh, so we have the ability to create different size images and even crop them intelligently sometimes if you've got, you know, you're willing to sit down and, and write some code for it. Uh, but then how do you get those images to be served correctly to the browser? So Picture Fill was developed to explore responsive images before a native browser implementation emerges. 
Sometimes when web standards are created, someone at Apple headquarters just writes whatever they feel like writing and then we have to deal with it, uh, which almost happened for this. But we had uh, a good uh, community rally around this and uh, Matt Wilto Marquis is uh, the responsive images community group leader for the W3C and he kind of uh, helped rally the, the troops. We've got a couple people in Drupal that are actively involved in this as well. Um, and kind of said, hey, no, this is not what we want. We, we want a different solution here. So picture fill is the prototype for that solution that the community uh, is leaning towards. And the code is on GitHub again. So here's another tool not by uh, Filament Group. The rest of these are just other standalone tools. Um, Modernizer, I'm sure everyone's heard of it. Um, and it solves a very specific problem uh, which is the old problem of user agent sniffing. Uh, how many people, let's get a show of hands, how many people have ever done like user agent sniffing or use mobile tools? You're like, oh, hey, mobile, yeah. Yeah, we've all, everyone raise your hand, yeah. Um, and so user agent sniffing doesn't really scale, especially as more and more new devices are created. Some of these devices are not going to be top of the line devices. Some of them are just other, uh, middle of the road type devices. There are other economies that aren't as um, developed as you know, first world countries and they also have people who are buying uh, phones that have what we would consider to be old uh, capabilities but it's still a good phone and it still can do uh, the activities that you need it to do on the internet. And uh, as web developers we should be striving to allow all people and all devices to access web pages um, as well as they can. So when we do user agent sniffing, what we do is we take a tiny little string in the web browser and we make every assumption possible after that. We just make assumptions about the user agent string. And if you've ever looked at one, I don't have one in these slides, but uh, for, for Chrome, example, for example, it has the words Mozilla, WebKit, Gecko, uh, Safari, Chrome, KHTML. It basically names every engine that has ever been popular in it. And so you can't really be like, oh, uh, Safari, this must be on a Mac, you know, because Safari's on Windows as well. And you just shouldn't be making assumptions like that from a user agent string. So the solution here is to detect individual features of a web browser. That sounds kind of hard now, doesn't it? But Modernizer makes it easy. And as a bonus, after it detects the features, it can allow you to conditionally load other assets that you might need were that feature present or not present. And the code here is at modernizer.com or on GitHub if you like GitHub. Everyone likes, likes GitHub. So let's talk about some Drupal tools. What problems has Drupal solved already? Speedy module. It's pretty cool. The problem is that uh, some of the JavaScript in Drupal core is not minified. Um, while this might not be your first issue that you want to tackle, it can definitely be one when you're starting to shave bytes off. Uh, and so this module ships uh, alternate versions of core JavaScript and it allows, uh, the, the, it allows those libraries to be minified and to reduce the size of them. So you've uh, y and I should say that you, you probably shouldn't be worrying about minifying files until you've uh, covered some of the other things that we've talked about already, such as uh, pictures and like images being responsive and so forth. Uh, because uh, as a point of reference here, um, just removing one JPEG from your website will have like 10 times as much impact as minifying your JavaScript. Uh, you're, you're just doing a lot more to decrease the uh, total weight of your website when you are uh, removing big assets than when you're just minifying files. But if you have a lot of JavaScript or if you have a web application that's based on 5,000 lines of JavaScript, something like minification is going to make a bigger difference. So this project is at Speedy, Drupal.org Speedy. And also we're adding a scripts at the bottom feature, uh, so you'll be able to do that automatically in Drupal. It's cool. Because right now, um, there are some really good methods for that, but they are not, um, 
they're not uh, modulified. You have to do it in code. So if people are a little averse to writing a hook to JS alter, then you might want to check out this module when we release a new version. So modernizer, uh, the new version, the new Drupal version. Um, the problem with maintaining a modernizer library is that as you add new features to your website, you, it can kind of be hard to keep track of what feature tests you need inside Modernizer. So when you uh, add geolocation to your website and then you want to do some feature detection for geolocation, if you haven't added it to Modernizer, it's not going to be there to test. And that's not good. But in Drupal, we've got all these different tools. We've got uh, you know themes that provide pieces of functionality. We have different modules that know what functionality they're providing. And so what we can do is we can use Drupal to communicate with Modernizer, and we are doing that in a library. Um, so uh, full disclosure, I maintain this module. Um, but uh, we're working on a Modernizer load API and a Modernizer test API to allow uh, modules and themes to uh, communicate to the, mo uh, the other Drupal modules and themes, communicate to the Modernizer module what tests they need and then the modernizer module can give you, the site administrator, a link to click on to go download your modernizer build. And uh, when modernizer 3 comes out, not to be confused with the modules 7x30 version, when modernizer, the JavaScript library, gets to 3.0, there will be a modular build feature, and we will, able to, we will be able to assemble these via Drush. So it's going to be super cool. Um, the API right now is does have a couple Drush commands to get you a development copy really quickly. It has libraries integration. Um, we're working on speedy integration. And the code is at drupal.org slash project slash modernizer. So back to picture fill, because this is an important one. Responsive images are really hard. Um, it's not really solved yet, as we've been talking about. There is a Drupal 7 module. There are actually several Drupal 7 modules that, in their own ways, uh, try to solve the responsive images problem. Um, I contributed to one, but uh, it was based on an earlier library that is now uh, just kind of defunct. And so we stopped uh, pushing on development of the Drupal module for it. Uh, but this one that I'm showing you on the screen is the active one that I would recommend going and trying. Um, it integrates with image styles. And uh, I believe it outputs, uh, or it has an option to output this picture tag that uh, is being worked on in picture fill. And additionally, if anyone's interested in Drupal 8 development, there is an issue here that you can follow and see how Core is going to deal with this for Drupal 8. I, I, uh, I, I wasn't at the keynote this morning, I'm sorry, but uh, I don't know if they talked about any of the Drupal 8 stuff. So. Uh, this is definitely being actively developed right now. And furthermore, the team that's working on the Drupal 8 implementation is actually helping influence the web standard. So the, the picture tag that is going to hopefully eventually be created, uh, the, the Drupal 8 team is, is actually helping uh, influence the formation of the standard, which is really cool. Because it helps us all solve our problems now, and it helps the, the standard that eventually gets solidified uh, will be already working within Drupal 8. Um, so one day people were just like, you know what, let's just put this in Drupal 8. Who cares if it's not ready yet? And the W3 was like, oh, really? Okay. Uh, well, let's talk about it. And uh, <laughs> But that's exactly how Picture Fill got created, uh, which was a bunch of people saying, you know what, we don't like the direction that this web standard is heading. Uh, it was called Source Set, and it involved putting a huge array of sources in the source tag. Uh, it was kind of silly. So people decided to make the picture tag instead. And Drupal 8 is jumping on board and we're helping out. So here is the third and probably most important section. Um, we've, uh, the, the links here are uh, not as numerous, but at the same time, this is not something you should skip because everyone's found themselves in a situation where you're wondering why, why is this happening to me? So webpagetest.org is one of the uh, tools that you can check out. And 
What it does uh, is it offers um, testing from uh, various browsers, uh, various locations in the world, and uh, it allows you to test a web page's performance as it downloads and as it executes in a browser. And this is a, a good real-world test. They're using real hardware, and they're not using uh, like VMs or, or you know, any sort of emulated software. So you're getting the real data, and then they push it out to you, and they show you all the data on the web page after the test queues and shows up. So what does it test? It can test, it can test the initial load time. Uh, it can test the repeat load time. So once your cache is warm, uh, your browser cache, that is, uh, you can see that, oh, you know, it may have taken 400K to download the first page, but on subsequent downloads, it's only 39K or something like that, which is awesome. That means you're doing really well. It will show you network waterfalls, the types of uh, diagrams that we were looking at before in Chrome. And it will show you the header for every request you're making, which uh, if you are a server admin or you're on the server side performance and scalability uh, end of things, uh, that's going to be really useful to you because you're trying to uh, make sure that all the headers are being set correctly and you're using varnish and all those crazy words that I'm not really like, I know the word but I don't know what I'm talking about. So point is, uh, go check this out and even if you're a server admin, it's your front end developer will be able to generate data for you and if they say they can't, be like, ah, but I heard you can go to this website and do that. So another tool is uh, Akamai Blaze, and this used to be called Blaze.io, uh, but Akamai uh, acquired them. And uh, this is uh, performance testing for mobile. And it does the exact same thing, except it uses mobile devices instead, which is pretty handy. So it'll show you, uh, it allows you to pick which device to test, and it'll do uh, an automatic number of page loads so that you can say, oh, only do this once. I'm only interested in the initial load at the moment. Or if you really want to know about your uh, load times with a warm cache, then you can start testing that after you've solved all your initial load problems. And once again, it will allow you to test from many, many locations all around the world. So uh, it's not specific to San Francisco or whatever. Um, you can test from close to where you live, which is awesome. Uh, so, yeah, that's about it. Um, that uh, I hope everyone got something out of this, and we've got a, a lot of time for questions because maybe I was a little nervous and talked too fast. But uh, you can go ahead and contact me. I'm a, a lame six-digit Drupal.org user number. Um, I am a Rupal on GitHub and Twitter and everything else. And then uh, you can contact me. Just email me at Chris at Four Kitchens if you'd like. Uh, but yeah, uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. Okay. Okay, so, yeah. All right, we've got a second world publishing website that uh, doesn't want to create two uh, mobile and desktop websites, although the primary audience is desktop users, just to repeat the question. Yep, of course. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. So this is uh, the 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 question was uh, when you have a responsive website you want a very lean mobile experience and you might want a more uh, 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 just a bigger and fuller desktop experience with more content in sidebars and so forth how do you handle those types of page loads and the answer is conditional loading um, we covered conditional loading for CSS uh, but Modernizer has the ability to conditionally load whatever you want. So uh, you could also use um, uh, the anchor include pattern, which is uh, also by Scott from Filament Group. Um, and this is actually something that could be very handy in uh, Drupal as well. So uh, in the context of Drupal, you would use this anchor include pattern to um, 
load a block, but don't load the content, just load the title and hyperlink it to a URI of the data. Now, this will be so easy when Drupal 8 comes out because Drupal 8 is going to be magical. Um, conditional loading. You want to load things based on conditions. And then a type of conditional loading is the anchor include pattern. And what happens is, uh, if you imagine a Drupal block, uh, the title would be hyperlinked to a URI that contains that content. And when the page loads, if your browser is meeting the conditions that say it should load additional content dynamically, what it will do is it will follow that URI and with Ajax, like fetch the data and fill in that block for you. But a mobile user would just see the title and they would be able to tap or, or s otherwise select the title and uh, then go look at that content uh, on its own as its own atomic block. Mm hmm Yes, sir. Then what happens when the browser disables JavaScript? Then when the browser disables JavaScript, then they won't get that content. And they'll, they should know that that's going to happen, yeah. Um, uh, they'll still be able to click on that title and see the content just like a mobile user would. Mm hmm So there's no loss of accessibility of content at all. Yes. Well, can I just answer one at a time and repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, so the question was about the picture fill work that's going into Drupal 8. Um, he, he's asking, uh, the interface is rather complex, and uh, I don't want to pull it up right now, but it is complex, and it's based on image styles, and there's media queries in there, and uh, just the question is, how are we going to make this accessible to a site admin that doesn't necessarily want to know what a media query is? Unfortunately, my answer for you, since I am not an authority or really an active participant in that particular issue, is I don't know. So uh, DrupalCon is a great place to hunt down the dude who is doing it or the person. Uh, so um, uh, I, I don't know if they're here in the room or anywhere else, but uh, I'm sure there will be a, a core conversation or something like that that's uh, more geared towards future looking uh, improvements to Drupal, but um, we may not be able to solve uh, those types of interface issues within core, but that's the great thing about contrib is that someone can come along and clean that interface up uh, in a contrib module and call it easy pictures or something like that. And did you say you had a second part to the question? Oh yeah, it doesn't it doesn't take into account that an image might be shown twice. Um, yeah, I got, I have nothing. So sorry. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah, um, modernizer actually doesn't address creating sprites. Um, there is a website. Uh, called Sprite Me? I don't know. Sprite Cow. Sprite Cow. Okay. So there's a couple. <laughs> and there's SAS also. Uh, the SAS will do it automatically, although uh, the directory-based SAS sprite generation leaves something to be desired for me at least. Um, but there are tools who will actually read the source code and the CSS of your web page, and it will tell you what to, to put how to organize your sprites because uh, spriting is a delicate uh, art that involves um, you know like if you've got a, a an image that repeats Y you can't sprite that next to something that repeats X because they'll cross over each other and stuff like that so um, I would just look for uh, sprite generation tools and uh, there's a couple out there maybe I'll add some links to this presentation when I publish the, the slides yes sir
Yes. Sure. Um, yeah, to condense that down that into a question and a statement, um, the, the no, not a big deal. Uh, the responsive images, the RE, RESP underscore image module, and the Drupal core implementation is going to cover multiple breakpoints. So I was contributing to another module called responsive underscore images and we only had like one set one breakpoint you know it was either small or big um, that was like 18 months ago though so at the time it was like way better than nothing um, you can actually uh, use a couple of those just depending on how simple or complex your need is um, I believe the Drupal 8 implementation is going to have multiple breakpoints since it's media query based and you can arbitrarily set it up yourself. What I mean is not multiple breakpoints, but multiple sort of. So on this page, I want to have these breakpoints, and on the other page, I want to have these breakpoints. Oh. I can only use your module, but my slider, I want to have four different, four different sizes for images, and on my content page, I want to have another four. Oh, right, right. The answer is JavaScript. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? S sorry, repeat again? Yes, I believe so. Like I said, I'm not an expert at that particular module. I'm sorry that everyone's asking questions about the thing that I don't know about. I know about everything else. Uh, so, um, I believe that it works off of image styles, uh, or what was known as image cache in D6. So, it you should be able to create multiple styles that may not even be dimension oriented. They they could be based on something else because with image styles, I'm pretty sure you can write a hook that's just like, hey, if this module exists, make this other image style. Um, so it's very arbitrary, and and you have PHP available to make whatever decision you need to make. Yeah. Mark. What? Oh, um, actually, okay, so the question was, is the work in core uh, going to uh, make use of data URIs? Uh, if people aren't familiar with data URIs, um, uh, you can add a well, hold on. So, data URIs are the ability to um, add arbitrary data, and it's prepended by the prefix data dash. And then you can put a bunch of data uh, in line in your HTML. And the question is basically, are we going to be able to? Uh, Use uh, inline data to help make decisions, and I'm pretty sure. No, no, no. Data URIs, like, like the basic oh, data URIs. Sorry. Uh, okay, data URIs, not data attributes. Sorry. Um, so the the real question was, are we going to be able to use data URIs, which is essentially the inlining of image data straight into a web page? Um, if you've ever gone to Google News and s tried to like inspect Element on some of the icons. When you look at it, you'll actually just see a bunch of base64 text. And um, at the moment, I'm not sure if data URIs are going to be implemented. But again, module, right? Well, do any of the modules handle that right now? Uh, I'm not aware of any that handle data URIs. Um, I do know that some pretty decent research has gone into uh, using data URIs for uh, images. And unless the image is smaller than about 5K, it's very often not uh, worth it to send that down the pipe as text uh, just because of caching and all that kind of thing. But you also have to consider how often it's going to be reused and that sort of thing as well. So um, get in there, cowboy. <laughs> yes, sir. It's a small thing. It's not really a question. It's just um, when you were saying, you know, for the reasons we should do this, it's actually not just for users. One thing I think is quite common is SEO. Because if your site responds so much faster, that gives you, you know, 
Yes. Uh, a point has been made um, that uh, some of this could be viewed as being for SEO, and uh, the counter that I always have to that statement is that SEO is for people anyway. So uh, if you do it for people to begin with, and uh, you will just naturally have better results. Um, it is very well known that Google places a high, high emphasis on uh, page speed nowadays. So uh, that is correct. If you do some of these things and you get your page loading much faster, then you will be viewed uh, more. Um, you will you will be viewed as a more valuable website uh, in a search engine. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, did I see a hand way over here on the side? No. Cool. Yes. Yes. Um, so, uh, LabJS is an interesting uh, one. Um, uh, Modernizer Load was actually written in response to LabJS. Both of the authors uh, live in in my current hometown of, of Austin, Texas. So um, I've had the privilege of talking to both of them directly about this type of thing. And uh, unfortunately, there is, a, there is a LabJS module, and it does work for Drupal. But uh, Kyle Simpson, the author of LabJS, had to specifically help uh, rewrite pieces of DrupalJS because um, all of the JavaScript that is in Drupal 7 core was never meant to be loaded asynchronously, and there can be problems when when you just go ahead and, and do that without uh, you know checking over the code and making sure that things were designed to have uh, tolerance for asynchronous loading. So there is a lot of thorny issues there, and there are d different reasons to use different uh, uh, script loaders. And um, uh, LabJS actually has a, a, a decent implementation within Drupal. So yeah, when it works. Uh, uh huh. And sometimes uh, you won't even see a, uh, you won't always see a performance boost from just automatically asynchronously loading all of your JavaScript. So yeah. We we have some dependency management issues also in core, which is what Mark was saying. That uh, uh, it means that you know when you use Drupal add JS, you want to be able to say, oh, I must be loaded after this, but before this, and so forth. And so there's a lot of dependency management issues that have to be addressed if we were to go and put uh, the ability to asynchronously load JavaScript into core. Uh, it's a little different when it's a contrib module because it's not, uh, you know, automatically going to be used by all components of Drupal. But excellent question. So uh, if that's about it, I guess I'll kick over to the obligatory uh, rate my session slide. Um, I made a tiny little uh, jump link for you if you want. Um, J.mp slash DC Munich dash HPT and I would love it if you would uh, click on or tap on uh, provide feedback on this session and uh, not only does it help me figure out how I can you know, present information better but it also helps DrupalCon figure out uh, you know how they can do it across the board so I appreciate that you came and thank you very much I will uh, edit the node and put a link to the slides in the, the node, so. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hey, how's it going, man? Yeah, good, man. How are you? Good, doing well. Now I'm doing awesome because now I have no responsibilities now. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Uh, I'll come say hi.
Yeah, definitely, man. Uh, yeah. Hey. Whole day of training yesterday. I literally finished my slides five minutes before. So yeah. I was like sitting here. It's been crazy yesterday. Awesome. Yeah. Good session. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have one? No, no, it's time. I just want you to relax. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Just kill me. Well, I feel you, man. So I'm over here until the 31st now. Mm. So oh, amazing. I mean, I'm going to sprint a little, but there's yeah. no like. What's the plan? Well, you said you guys going to Belgium. Right? Yeah, we're going to. Popping up to the pub there? Yeah, 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 we're going to Brussels and then I'm flying out of Amsterdam because it's like way cheap. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, like, I don't know. But uh, I'm just going to figure out a, a path over there. I don't know. Nice. nice. Yeah. But, uh, are you. How long are you sticking around for? Um, I'm around Friday. I think we'll leave in Saturday for that Austria. Oh, cool. So, Are you going to go to Sam's talk? Yeah. I don't know, I think that talk's going on. Something nah, I know there's a bunch of things going on. But tonight I think it's going, I always want to sound a lot, but if you look good, you'll get to Yeah, we need it, we need to definitely get to it. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Catch you later, yeah? Yeah, catch you later. How's it going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Basically, uh, the gist of it is that you can, if you point to a CSS file that has the same name as a core file, but you don't put it in your theme, then it will just delete it. It'll, it'll remove it. But yeah, that'll have a write-up. No, it won't. Uh, but it's possible that we might be able to write a tool to do that in Drupal 8. In Drupal 7, I don't see how it can happen. Um, maybe, well, maybe. You know what? If you file an issue in the module, then the onus is on me to either figure out if it's possible at all or not. So, file an issue. And then we can talk about it. Because that's not something that's been a priority for me at the moment. I've been working on uh, module integration, um, and that is actually a very interesting uh, discussion that should be had. It's a very good point. Well, you could use both, too, uh, which is a really good point that you have. So, um, the problem is that the content of the aggregates is not necessarily known sometimes, and so we would have to figure out a way to know what we're loading because there is CSS that you always want to load synchronously and then there's some stuff, often it's JavaScript but sometimes it's CSS, that you want to load asynchronously because it's not necessary like at the time of page load. Yeah. CSS is most of the time, you want that to block the rendering of the web page though when you load CSS. Like that essential tool, it blocks the rendering of the web page while it figures out what CSS to load. And then it lazy loads the rest that it doesn't need. Yeah. So yeah, very, uh, very good point. Thank you for bringing it up. Dude, yeah. how's it going? Going good. How are you? Yeah, I saw you yesterday, but I was too busy. I just had like run by, and I was like, I'll catch up with him later. Did you train yesterday? Or? Uh, sort of.